today to the church, we see that there's something certainly that we have forgotten or we have laid aside. We have not taken it seriously. The words of Jesus, the teaching of the apostles, and I think that it's time for us to come back to the simple words of Jesus. We can go in all sorts of deep teachings, you know, get into the detail of every Hebrew word, Greek word, the explanation of one word, and we can get, get along, you know. But at the end of the day, let us get back to the simple words of Jesus. And I think that this is important to us. Okay, so let us open our Bibles this morning in the book of Luke, chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, read from verse 49. There are things that Jesus said to his disciples that they did not understand at that time. They certainly understood afterwards what Jesus meant when he spoke to them words that would explain the plan of God for his own life, for the life of Jesus himself. And in Luke chapter 12, verse 49, he says, I came to send fire on the earth, and now I wish it were already kindled. But I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how distressed I am till it is accomplished. Do you suppose that I came to give peace on earth? I tell you, not at all, but rather division. For from now on, five in one house will be divided, three against two, and two against three. Father, will be divided against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against a daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against a mother-in-law. So we will try to just keep an eye on verse 50, which is what Jesus said, but I have a baptism to be baptized with and how distressed I am till it is accomplished. So what is Jesus talking about at this time? We know that he had already been baptized by John the Baptist. We all know that. So certainly he is not talking about that baptism is talking about another one that he had to take. Now remember that many times when Jesus talks, he talked in the spirit. It was not natural things. But he tried to explain things, but the disciples did not understand. Now I want just to remind you, you pastors and leaders of churches, I think that you, you, you know what baptism is all about. Mm -hmm. Baptism is very clear in the Bible. Mm -hmm. It talks about being immersed under water and coming on the other side a new man, in a new life. That's what it talks. So when we talk about baptism, when Jesus talks about baptism here, he's certainly talking about the cross that he had to take. And he said, 
how distressed I am till it is accomplished. He had to go through that route, on that route. That was the aim of the Father to send him, was to come and suffer, die, and rose again from the dead. So when Jesus talks about baptism here, that's what we need to understand. I, re I, used, I remember when I was baptized that I had taken a decision, not only to accept to be a Christian, but to give my life to Christ, to accept whatever would come my way. And even if I did not fully understand what it meant, which I now understand what it means, I was ready. I was ready to walk on that route, accept what would come before me, and today I understand that things need to happen in my life. I need to go through difficult times in my life, die to my own desires so that I can carry resurrection life. So that's, that's the Christian foundation. That's the apostolic foundation. That's the foundation of Christianity. So Jesus was not talking just like a baptism that he was going to take. He was leading to the cross. And he meant what he said. That he was going to suffer, that he was going to die, and he was going to rise up again from the dead. This is what he was talking about now. And if we look in Mark chapter 10... Mark chapter 10... He speaks the same language again in verse 35. When James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him saying, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? They said to him, Grant us that we may sit one on your right hand and the other on your left in your glory. This is what they wanted. You know, you know many Christians, they always want the blessings. They always want the good things from God. They want privileged places. That like these two disciples wanted. And this is what he said to them. You do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink? And be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? Are you able to drink the cup that I drink and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with, they said to him, we are able. They did not understand anything. They were trying to figure out in the natural what Jesus was saying. What cup was he talking about? What baptism was he talking about? Yes, we can. They were just thinking about drinking a cup. They were thinking about sinking into the water and coming back on the other side. Something like that. But Jesus said to them, you do not know what you're talking about. You will indeed drink the cup that I drink. Jesus had a plan for them. He knew the plan that he had for his disciples. He knew what was going to happen to their lives. He knew what they would become one day. He knew the road that they had to take when they would go into the ministry. He knew all that. That's why he said to them, yes, you will be able to drink the cup and to be baptized 
with the baptism that I'm going to take. New. You will indeed drink the cup that I drink, and with the baptism I am baptized, with you will be baptized. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it is prepared. So Jesus was pointing to the cross that he had to take. And he was trying to tell them and make them understand that they also would have to take the same road. The same road. Are you able to drink the cup I am going to drink? What was the cup? It was the cup of suffering. That's what Jesus was talking about. The cup of suffering and the cup of death. That's what baptism is all about. When you really decide that you are ready to follow Christ to the point of losing your life so that you can come out in resurrection life, then you understand what baptism is all about. That's the, many, that's the reason why many Christians get baptized and they continue to live their life in the world because they don't know what they have done. And in many churches, what do we do? We just tell the people, you're born again. Now the next step is to be baptized. They don't know what it takes. They don't even know what it means. It's just the next step after being born again. But baptism is a life that you give. You are ready to lose it. That's what it means. You are ready to die to your own desires. You are ready to deny yourself of your rights so that you can receive Christ's life in return. They did not understand. But this is what Jesus was telling them. He knew that one day they were going to serve him, be responsible of the church, become models and examples take up their cross and follow Jesus. Jesus knew what was going to happen to them, but they did not understand. Now open your Bibles with me again in Matthew chapter 16. We read from verse 21. We need to know God's plan. We need to know the plan of the Lord for our lives as Christians and pastors. We need to know what God has planned for us. We need to understand the Christian life. The simple Christian life. To Matthew chapter 16 verse 21. From that time, Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. So Jesus is announcing to them that he would suffer, he would die, and he would be risen from the dead. That's what he's announcing them. Okay? Now, the most intelligent of them all, Peter, took him aside and began to rebuke him. Again, he didn't understand anything. Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. You know how many times I have heard people say that you don't need anymore to take part in the sufferings of Christ or to identify with the death of Christ because he has done everything. You don't have to do anything but just enjoy. And be happy as a Christian. 
You know, when you don't understand, when you don't have the revelation of what the Christian life is all about, the true message of Christ is understood to be false. Peter did not understand. Do you know how many Christians and pastors and leaders of churches don't understand the real message of Christianity? The simple message of Christianity, what it is all about, the foundation message, the message that Jesus simply preached and that the apostles preached. That's why I'm happy, I enjoy, I rejoice when people oppose the message of the cross of Jesus Christ. It's normal because when you do not catch the revelation, you'll find it strange. Yeah. Christians will prefer, you know, to have messages that would bless them, that will multiply them, that will give them all sorts of blessings every day, that receive so many promises in life. That's what they like. So Jesus was telling the disciples in three cases here, I am going to suffer, I am going to die, and I am going to raise up from the dead. Very clear message from Christ. Now, let's open our Bibles in Luke chapter 14. Because many people say that this was the plan of God for Jesus. But I want you to see that this is the plan, the same plan. Same plan. That God said, had for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now Jesus will give us an invitation. In verse 26, he says, in fact, verse 25, now great multitudes went with him. Multitudes followed him. Thousands and thousands followed him. And he turned and said to them, if anyone of you comes to me and does not hate his father, his mother, wife, children, brothers, sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. He cannot be my disciple. If he loves his life more than he loves me, you are not prepared to be my disciple. And we know that there were thousands that followed him for healings, for deliverance. Thousands followed him. But the time had come that he had to tell them the truth. Things that were deeper and that would mean that if they did not follow what Jesus said there, you don't have to continue to follow me. You are not going to follow me all your life for me to bless you. You are not going to follow me all your life because you want a healing from me. No. But if you love your life more than you love me, then it stops there. Don't come after me. Simple words. That the church is ignoring. And whoever 
does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Simple, clear, no ambiguity. Yeah. Lord, I've just bought two oxen. I've got to go and try them. Uh, Lord, somebody of my family just died. Give me some time to go and bury them. You know the result. You know the answer. Don't you know the answer? You know. Clear, simple, no ambiguity, no compromise. Clear words. If you want to follow me to get something for me to bless you and give you food all day, I've given you enough of that. Now, it's another dimension. Another dimension. If you are not ready to take up your cross. Remember what he said to his disciples three times? I am going to suffer, I am going to die, I am going to rise up from the dead again. You remember? Three times I told you. I am going to drink my cup. I am going to be baptized with another baptism. You remember? All that speaks of the same thing. I am going to take my cross. That's what I came for, to die for the salvation of mankind. That's what I came. And here there's an invitation to, from Jesus to follow him on the same path. If you are not ready to take your cross, don't follow me. You are not my disciple. You are, I'm not talking about being a pastor here. No, 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 no. I'm talking about disciples. Do you understand? You can only be a disciple if you are ready to take up that cross and follow Jesus. If you are ready to suffer. When you talk about the cross, you talk about suffering. When you talk about the cross, you talk about death. And when you talk about the cross, you talk about resurrection life. That's what you talk about. That's what Jesus was saying. That's how we invited them to follow him. One way. He says, come with me on that route. And Jesus is saying to them, there will never be a substitute to become a disciple. The words that Jesus said will never be changed. Never. There will be no substitute to become a disciple of Christ. No substitute. You can learn the Bible. You can become a doctor of theology. You can go five years at the Bible school, but if you don't want to identify your life with the sufferings of Christ, with the death of Christ, you are not his disciple. If you don't want to take up that cross. In other words, what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying this is the foundation of your life. Everything that you do will depend on which foundation your life lays. All the decisions of your life will be taken according to the foundation on which your life lays. You know Christians take thousands of decisions in life. We have decisions to take in life, I'm sure, all of us. Amen? And many of us take good decisions and many of us take bad decisions. Amen? But when your life is on that foundation, 
You don't look at your interest anymore. And that helps you to take spiritual decisions. But when your life is not on that foundation and you do not agree to partake to his sufferings and in his death, your decisions will be shallow. In other words, you will take decisions according often to what will become an interest to you. It will be for your life, for your interest. Yeah? That's why when you talk about the cross of Christ, you need to understand it's the foundation of your life. Foundation. You know what foundation is all about? This building is built on a foundation. If that foundation is not good, you shall see cracks everywhere. That's what Jesus was saying. And he never said, you know, if you don't pray one hour, you cannot be my disciples. He didn't say that. He didn't say if you don't fast once a week, you can't be my disciples. No, he didn't say that. This is your choice. Prayer is your choice. Huh? Fasting is your choice. Reading the Bible is your choice. Prayer is your choice. But taking the cross is not even a choice. It's not even an option. Because it becomes the foundation of everything that will follow. Everything. It all depends there. And that's why we see Christians today... Thousands and millions of Christians walking a carnal life. They walk in the flesh. Hmm? What I call green Christians. <laughs> green. Since they are born again and 15 years after they are the same. They never grow. Why? Why? They come to church every Sunday. They go to every prayer meeting. They take part in the praise and worship. Huh? They fast. They intercede. They go on the mountain. Huh? You go on the mountain and you fast for seven days and you come back home. Uh, it's as if you are the man of the hour. <laughs> and then when your, your wife cooks the meal and it's a little bit burned, oh, poor lady. <laughs> That's why Jesus invites us to walk on that narrow road. Our whole life will be transformed. Because that is the message of Christianity. Let's go on. Luke 14. Verse 33. So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has. Ay, ay, ay. My piece of land there. He cannot be my disciple. Does your Bible say the same thing that I read here? <laughs> so likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has, he cannot be my disciple. When God blesses you, he should be allowed to do what he wants with that blessing. 
He blesses you and the next day he can say, give me all. So what did you bless me for, Lord? Why did you bless me then? Why did you give that to me? Huh? And the next morning you wake up and the Lord says, give it all. God will always test your faith. And how you want to follow him. How you want to follow him. Now you understand why thousands of Christians do not have their lives on that right foundation. Because they love their lives more than they love Jesus. Because they are not prepared to give away everything that the Lord asked them to do. Their life is theirs. They hold their lives in their hands. The cross is too difficult for them to bear. Too difficult for them to bear. The price is too high. No one, no one put that price that high. No, not a man said that. A man did not say that. Jesus said that. And he thinks it's wise for a man to take up his cross and follow him. You know why? Because if you don't take up your cross and follow Jesus, you are not prepared to identify and partake to his sufferings and his death, you will never have resurrection life. That's why the message of the cross is suffering, death, and resurrection. Jesus never said, I will suffer and die and stop there. He said, I will suffer, I will die, I will rise up from the dead. <laughs> That's what the cross is all about. Right? You can't just dwell, dwell there on suffering, dwell on death. No, you must look at the future. Look what's waiting for you. What's waiting for you is life. Resurrection life. The, when you get baptized, you get out of the water, what it says? In newness of life. It's not, it's not a, a, an instant thing. But it means that when you are ready to die, you are under the water, you are drowned. Do you understand? And then you rise up in newness of life. That's why Jesus said, are you ready to be baptized? Oh, yes. That's the second step. After No, no, no. Don't talk about second step. Don't just talk about what you are ready. How you are ready to live your Christian life. Then you go and take baptism. Otherwise, stay home. Or be in church until God takes your life and you understand what it means to be baptized. Same language. Same language. Not different. Huh? So when you don't understand and we, you, you don't have the revelation of the message of the cross, people get baptized for nothing. That's what they do. They get baptized for nothing because just, it's just a second step. And they get born again, and then you say, now we've got to have a teaching. Come, and I'll show you how, how you must be baptized now. Oh. The guy gets baptized, he doesn't even know what he's talking about. He doesn't even know that his life doesn't belong to him anymore. He doesn't know what's waiting for him tomorrow. He doesn't even know the trial and the test and the affliction that's waiting for him. He doesn't even know that, he's going, that he will have to suffer with Christ. He doesn't know. But he gets baptized, and then he gets a certificate of baptism. One month after, he's gone. I'm not saying that's the normal way, but we experience that. Mm. 
And Jesus took the risk of losing every one of them. <laughs> every one of them. Are you ready to lose everyone? Are you ready to lose everyone? Or ten percent of them? Twenty percent of them? We must know what is the plan and the vision of God. We must know what's the vision. We must know how Jesus builds his church. Just not a matter of going there, evangelize, and then they come to church and you talk to them about this, that, and the other. When you start to build a house, what do you do first? You call the electrician? And you tell him how the electrician works? That's what you tell him? Huh? Or you tell him that you've got a good plumber somewhere? No. When he wants to build a house, you dig. You put foundation there. And a strong one. <laughs> Then you are safe. Build on it now. Just build on it. This, that, and the other. But first, lay down that foundation. That foundation must be laid. That's why the church of the book of Acts was strong. Because their lives were on its foundation. The message of the cross, amen, was written on the tables of their hearts. They knew that they could not advance further. And if they would advance further, they would advance in the flesh. Because the message of the cross talks about suffering and death. You can't remove that part. Who are you? Who are you to remove that part? Oh, death? No. Too much. Too hard. Die to myself? Die to my desires? Die to my pride? No, it's too hard. It's too painful. No, no. Let's write it off. You write that piece off, and then you write what? You write off what? Oh, suffering. I'll tell you about it. You write the suffering on. What do you left? Oh, life. It's lovely, huh? I don't get life. Oh, get the anointing. Get the power. How will you get that? How can you get that? Huh? Oh, someone came to my church and he told me, you've got your double anointing. <laughs> double anointing. Now you start to, oh, you are the man. Hallelujah, praise God. Got the double anointing. You scrap off the part of suffering, you scrap off the part of death, and you want the life only. But how can you, how can you resurrect without dying? Can you give me, give, give me the, the, how can you do that, you? Can, you, can somebody tell me how we can resurrect before dying? Do you have, do you have a, a way to do that? Can somebody tell me? How do you rise up from the dead if you are not dead? You must be dead first to rise up. That's why for you to get life, you've got to die first. Jesus was not wrong. He preached sound Doctrine. Truth. That's what he preached. He didn't talk in the air. He didn't say, okay guys, you know, when you've got time, you just take up your cross and follow me. When you've got time, don't worry about it. Eh? No, 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 no. He said, if you want to follow me, be my disciple, 
No, my friend. You take that cross every day. You partake to my sufferings. Remember? The two boys came and said, Oh, Jesus, please, give us what we are going to ask you. Jesus said, what do you want? That's what, that's what Christians do. They sit down half an hour in their room and they say, Lord, this is what I want. Please give it to me. You've said in your word, ask everything that you want. And it shall be given unto you. Anything you can ask. No matter what you do, how you walk, whatever, just ask. <laughs> That's a joke. <laughs> huh? You know why Jesus said, if you want to anything, ask, and it shall be given unto you? Let me tell you why. Because when your life is laid on that foundation, you will not ask God anything for yourself. You'll ask God the things that pertain to the kingdom of God. What will build that kingdom? What will build that church? You don't have to ask God for a house. He knows what you need. He knows what you need. You don't have to ask him. Ask him. God, what do I need to do to build your kingdom? And the only way you can ask that type of thing is when your life stands on that foundation. Because you don't love your life more than the kingdom. You don't love your life more than the church. You don't have two masters. Paul says, you must live not for yourself, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, but for the one who gave his life for you and rose again from the dead. Christians outside that foundation leave their lives for themselves. They make plans for themselves. How to get richer. Thinking it's God's plan. <laughs> Take one word out of there. Oh, wonderful. You take one word there. You don't even know where it comes from. What, what, what Jesus said before and after. They don't understand. They have, they have no idea. Why well, open that? That television, I see preachers talking about, ask whatever you want, and then we give it to you. I want to, I don't know what. Switch off that television. Huh? There is no substitute for the cross of Christ in our lives. No substitute. Yes. It's the start of everything. This is what will bring security. Your total dependence on Christ. Your total dependence on Him. Not this world. Not man. Not anybody. On Christ. That's the foundation. That's apostolic foundation. This is what the first apostles preached. Amen. Have you ever thought why Jesus started with ten apostles and not ten evangelists? Did you understand why? Why didn't he establish twelve prophets or twelve pastors? No. Because apostles need to put foundation first. You, you, you need to come and lay that foundation first. And you know what Paul says? I have been given the grace of God. 
as a wise architect to lay down the foundation. He doesn't stop there. And he says, beware. Be careful how everyone now builds on it. Be careful how you build on it. That's why you need to be begotten as a son in the gospel. And then all these ministries come and put one brick here, one brick there, one brick there, one brick there, one brick there, and you see the temple of God rise up. And what is that? You're looking now at Christians being strong, mature, spiritual, yeah, that have gone through tests and trials of life, fire. Yes. You can't substitute that. You know why? You will never find in the New Testament that Jesus gave any other reason to be a disciple except what I read to you. You will not find out. You will find nothing. Jesus laid a condition to be a disciple. And the only one is what I read to you in Luke chapter 14, and you will find the same thing in Matthew chapter 16. Same thing. Huh? Now, it's serious stuff. But unfortunately, the majority of leaders of churches do not know how to build the church. They don't know how Jesus wants to build. Some churches have music as foundation. Music as foundation. To get people in church, they have to get good music. Some of them have got money, some of them all sorts of things, all sorts of things. All sorts of foundation in the church. That's the only thing that will keep people. That's the only thing that will keep Christians stop to be butterflies. Because they have caught it from the beginning, some time of their life. They have understood that they've got to partake to the sufferings of Christ, which we shall explain. They have to partake to the death of Christ so that they can partake to resurrection life. What's resurrection life? The life of Christ in you. Amen. That's how we want to serve Him. We don't want to serve the Lord with our knowledge. Everybody can learn the Bible. A Gentile, not born again, can take the Bible and learn it. Yeah. But when Paul talks about the ministry of the Spirit in Corinthians. Oh, that's another story. Read with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Chapter 2. We read from verse 6. We'll do it quickly, huh? okay? However, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages of our glory, for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew, for had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory." 
For it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things. Yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Amen? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God. That we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. These things we also speak. Not in words which men's wisdom read teachers. Here you are. Hmm? But which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. You see, when we talk about the ministry of the Spirit, it bypasses the wisdom of men, okay, the intelligence of men. That's why you can know the Bible, and that book can become a letter to you. Just a letter. It kills, but the Spirit gives life gives life. You want to minister in the Spirit. How can you do it? How can you do it? How can you minister in the Spirit? Your wisdom, your intelligence, your knowledge. That's why you need life. You need life. You need resurrection life. That's what I need. That's how I want to serve him. I, want to serve, I don't want to serve him with myself, with all I know. I want the ministry of the Spirit. I want resurrection life. That's what Christianity is all about. You will see it everywhere. In every doctrine of Christ, you will see suffering, death, and resurrection. That's all you'll see everywhere. And yet, the church has forgotten it. Put it in a drawer. Now we teach all sorts of things. This, that, and the other. No foundation. No foundation. Christians don't know what they need to do with their lives. They want to learn. They want to learn. They want to know. But they don't know what God wants to do in their own lives. No foundation. And yet it's the beginning of all things. The beginning of all things. Your whole life rests on it. Your decisions. Your ambitions. It's amazing how you, when your life is on that foundation, your life is not yours anymore. You don't want to please yourself. Because when your life is on the cross, you want to give it. You want to give it. You don't want anything for yourself. That's why you are prepared to lose every, every battle. You're prepared to lose everything. Every battle, every argument, everything. That belongs to you. Somebody wants to take it. Take it. If they want to fight you with that, take it. Hmm? Come to the place where you feel that you are so weak in yourself. And you do not have the, the, the courage and the strength to fight anybody. Have the same mind that was in Christ Jesus. Have the same mind. Peter expresses it another way. He says, have the same sentiment, attitude, like Jesus had. Same way. That's how we need to become. To become men of the Spirit. 
to become a voice in the Spirit, to carry God's authority, to carry God's life, to be able to minister in the Spirit, not words of wisdom. I read you one verse and we close. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. That's the Apostle Paul. And I think every one of us would love to be like him. Amen? But what he's saying there is not <laughs> a life without hustles, crying, suffering, dying. <laughs> Read with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ crucified. I was with you in weakness. Hi. Where are the strong men of God here? In weakness, in fear. And in trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and power. So that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. That is our ministry. Amen. And don't believe that you are going to get it free. <laughs> when I say free, I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about the price that one has to pay. Amen. Amen. For more information about CTMI, visit our website, ctmi.org.